Okay, over to Pierre. One, two, okay. So hi everyone, uh, thanks for attending, I guess. Uh, I'm Pierre, uh, this is my first time both in uh, activity and in Hungary. Uh, I have worked for eight years uh, within the French National Cybersecurity Agency and uh, the French Ministry of Defense. Uh, I also spent two years as a CISO for a multinational company. And now I'm working as a cybersecurity uh, researcher within Kaspersky's Great. Uh, I'm a full-time remote worker from my hometown in rural France, as you may hear from my accent. Uh, during those uh, difficult uh, pandemic and uh, war times, I found myself a new patient uh, to relax. Um, suing. And I believe you'll have a uh, fun time uh, while I'm sharing it with you. I'm uh, really sure we'll have a lot of fun, as uh, can be seen in this picture, uh, where, by the way, the guy is suing on a machine which is literally called the cowboy suing machine. Uh, of course, I'm kidding. I'll talk about Viasat and uh, specifically tell you the story of the work we did on the event they faced uh, eight months ago now that they called a cyber event in their own terms. On the 24th of uh, February, the day that the Kremlin is announcing the invasion of uh, Ukraine, everything suddenly starts to get a bit uh, wild for all users that reach internet uh, through the Viasat-owned KASAT satellite connection. KSAT users uh, and access providers uh, massively report loss of uh, internet connection until they discover it is actually their access modems uh, that seem totally dead. Uh, on the display capture from a specialized forum in March, uh, user assesses its modem firmware might be corrupted uh, from the states of the LED lights in the modem. Various public sources, uh, including major medias, uh, will report tens of thousands of uh, users uh, as affected, including uh, the modems that were used by Enercon, a German energy provider. Uh, they use such modem to provide access uh, to their wind turbines uh, control system. Guess it's starting to get quite a big of a cyber event now. But is this the result of a sabotage or an accident? Uh, why would someone or somebody disrupt the KSAT service on the exact day uh, Russia is starting to invade Ukraine? Is the answer hidden in the question? Many questions that everybody asked, or not, actually, but, well, they have been mostly left uh, unanswered. Uh, because, you know, uh, secret investigation first, and there's a war to deal with, so priorities. Uh, let's try to get part of those answers. First, from the Ukrainian government uh, website, which lists all their requests for proposals, also known as a call for bids. Well, we can discover that the Ukrainian military, uh, security services, uh, and a whole lot of government bodies actually are actually uh, relying on KSAT internet services a lot. We can find uh, 10 of requests for proposal uh, mentioning the purchase or the operation of KSAT modems between um, 2016 and uh, 2021. Well, at least we could uh, before the incident. Uh, the displayed screenshot actually come from an archived uh, version of uh, the, the Call for Proposal website. Here is what you can uh, find now. Uh, so you might not be able to read it. Let me translate it for you. Uh, this page has been temporarily censored to hinder Russian spies. Uh, that might have been a clue already. But then if you looked for something more explicit, then the European Union came to the rescue on May 10, directly uh, pointing at Russia. Then how did that happen? Uh, right from the start in early March, um, a lot of more or less off-the-wall uh, theories emerged, including some which considered satellites, battles, and hijacking. Uh, Space Force style at the very edge of a Star Wars episode. Well, we'll leave it with uh, Disney uh, to think about how they would like to produce such an episode, but luckily, the first Viasat statement reported by Reuters on March 12 uh, came to the rescue. March 12, 17 days after the incident, while a responsive communication, Viasat stated that hackers got in a management network which enabled uh, modem control. That's all. On March 14, um, I just came back from vacation, and I'm pretty sure there's no turning back from such a fact, um, and I discovered this news. I thought it deserved a bit of investigation so that I also started to work on it uh, to come up with my own Star Wars uh, theories. 
So what's a management network in Viasat terms? According to uh, Viasat modems data sheets, as they could uh, be found on uh, a publicly available website that are aimed at um, Viasat technicians, uh, it could only be either TR69 or SNMP. You probably know about SNMP, a simple network management protocol. As for TR69, if you don't, it is also called Customer Premise Equipment 1 Management Protocol. So it's an HTTP SOAP-based protocol usually aimed at uh, remote controlling, supervising, and updating uh, modems. Uh, by the way, we can find uh, that Viasat selected the German provider Axiros um, as a provider for their TR69 infrastructure starting in 2013. We can guess hackers might have reached a TR69 control server, also known as an ACS, and as so could deploy a, a malicious update to Viasat modems. And it turns out the ACS system for Axiros, called Access, was, uh, for instance, vulnerable to Log4Shell. So that's not totally unrealistic. If we dig a bit more, uh, we can find some Viasat provided firmwares designed for one of their systems that they called Community Internet. So the system is aimed at uh, providing internet and satellite-based internet access to isolated communities. Analyzing those firmwares enab enable confirming Viasat indeed relies on TR69 for at least some of their devices. What's more, uh, TR69, um, the, the TR69 management network is rich through a Fortinet compliance, uh, IPsec, VPN, rather than directly exposed uh, to the internet. So then hackers would have uh, needed to pass the VPN boundary uh, to get in the management network. Sure, there's a lot of uh, now well-known critical vulnerabilities on most uh, commercial off-the-shelf VPN gateways, but secrets that are required to connect to the VPN management network are of course stored clear text in those firmware I just found on the internet. So I needed a few hours from the end of my uh, vacation to these findings, including the VPN access. So I figure it would not have been hard at all uh, for a state actor to get in the so-called management networks. Four days later, on March 18, a source uh, points us at an executable binary that has been submitted to a public online multi-scanner multi service from an IP address in Italy. Uh, mark that for later. A few reverse engineering hours later, my colleagues and I determined the executable binary is a wiper compiled for the MIPS architecture aimed at erasing files and flash memories in the Linux platform. The wiper workflow is very simple. Code starts uh, by printing a lookout message to the console, delete files on the file system by overwriting their first bytes, and erase existing storage memories, and write new data over them. The wiper uses the content of a pre-filled uh, buffer to overwrite data. This buffer is stuffed with bytes uh, from integer values that are decremented in a loop. As a result, the content of a white memory, uh, which is erased by this wiper, is filled with such pattern and is very specific. The wiper pays uh, close attention to flash memory erasing because um, it tries to use driver-provided and hardware-backed uh, erase function but then, on top of that, he overwrites uh, the content of the memory. On March 18, we had a plausible intrusion path, a realistic uh, operation overview, and a malicious wiper, which could be the main cause of the modem troubles that we, uh, by the way, dubbed Cosmic Wiper. Considering an already negative opinion uh, from several organizations against Kaspersky back then, as well as, uh, and most of all, um, some confidentiality requirement from the source that pointed us to the wiper, uh, we did not write or talk about these findings at all. Whatever. On March 30, uh, 12 days after our findings, and one month after the event, Viasat finally published an official statement on their own website. Viasat confirms hackers get in a management network, but also explain they did so by bypassing a Fortinet VPN, which match our findings. Viasat also tells remote control capabilities have been leveraged by hackers to deploy destructive tools on modem, which also match our findings. And um, by the way, uh, Viasat blames Skylogic, one of their operating partners in Italia, which may match the Italian origin of the wiper submission on a multi-scanner service. One day later, on the 31, a US cybersecurity company will publicly describe Cosmic Wiper under the name Acid Rain. 
Anyway, before those public statements and details, even if we had a good overview of the incident and some strong hypothesis, we wanted to check real modems, like those which were wiped, and in order to confirm they used DR69 or that Cosmic Wiper uh, worked on such uh, platforms and try to learn a bit more, of course. To do so, we needed real devices, production firmwares. And we just did not find any of them. Um, they are not publicly distributed. Most likely, nobody tried to get such um, device and firmwares before uh, the incident, except maybe for the attackers. And the whole story was under intelligence agency investigation back then. So we needed to get our end on uh, some real devices and try to extract the firmware out of it. As often, when we need to get a hand on some uh, specific devices, it all starts in the darkest of the dark web, Craigslist. Well, I went to a French equal, uh, but still a bit of shopping later, uh, I get one of those walking KSAT modems, and well, now I'll try to make uh, spit him a firmware. First, we had a quick look at the uh, user-exposed network services and noted the vulnerability scope is quite limited. Only HTTP and DHCP services are exposed on the LAN by default and are based on a lightweight software of no known vulnerability. Our HTTP service also did not accept any direct user input. We then quickly jumped to the next step, also admittedly because we wanted to, which is tearing the device apart. So you might see there's an FPGA and a bridge type chip. Um, first is aimed at demodulating the signal from the supposedly attached uh, antenna. Uh, second is likely orchestrating uh, communication between the CPU and the other chips. Then comes uh, MIPS64 CPU, which already confirms the cosmic wiper would match uh, the, the modem architecture. Then our most wanted chip, the one which probably stores the firmware we are looking for, a flash memory of 100 MEX, uh, only persistent and uh, permanently attached storage in the device. Last but uh, not least, prepared pins that are just waiting us to show them some love. Uh, we can expect copying a flash memory content in its own bed using a protocol such as SPI, motherboard JTAG, or any system that can access it and that is exposed through a communication interface on the device, uh, starting by the operating system itself. Exploring starts with uh, the, 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 multi, the, the most obvious tool I have. Uh, I'm a mere enthusiast. So a multi-tester for some continuity testing, a multi-purpose hardware diagnostic interface, in that case, uh, a Vespirat, and cables. There are no SPI on the flash, so that's a dead end. Uh, some URIT pins, a serial interface, in other words, can quickly be spotted on uh, the device using continu continuity testing from uh, the CPU surrounding to the prepared pin on the motherboards, uh, thanks to the CPU data sheet that is available on the internet. As for JTAG, we still have 15 unidentified uh, pins on the motherboards, uh, which don't match any known JTAG standard. Some specialized devices can brute force uh, JTAG pinning. It's, um, well, rather expensive, and coming from a rural area where every cent is a lot, uh, I prefer the cheaper alternative which relies on uh, GPI or pins from a Raspberry Pi and an open source software which is called Go GTAGenum. Unfortunately, a JTAG layout could not be identified. Uh, and I'll test, uh, I learn later that the JTAG is actually not connected and not prepared uh, on this board. As an exploration summary, uh, we could only identify a serial interface and can only continue from there. And here is what the serial interface um, is going to show us if we connect any uh, terminal to it. A few boot logs, um, boot log lines, uh, from a likely bootloader early stage, and that's all. No way to interrupt the boot process, no way to uh, feed the terminal with any input, actually. The input is just not accepted. So at this point, it also seems like it is a dead end. Uh, then we can switch to a more um, drastic approach uh, to try dumping the flash, namely unsoldering the memory, uh, feed it to an expensive programmer, and uh, read all its bytes. But the chip uh, could be broken during unsoldering, and being able to put the chip back on the board is in no way guaranteed, notably because uh, I'm not that composed and uh, certainly not experienced to do such. Also, I didn't want to. So at this point, uh, just like a police officer during an investigation, um, I have a moment of clarity. 
Maybe uh, if I eat hard enough on the motherboard with an EV object, of course, it will finally confess to something. Of course, I'm kidding. Yet, we could see from the terminal messages uh, earlier that the modem is likely leveraging a bootloader. What if we could trouble such a bootloader uh, when it checks for RAM, for instance, um, or, or anything else? Maybe we can trigger uh, additional useful messages at least. But how to? Uh, remember when I tried to trick you into thinking this would be a sewing workshop? I did not. Uh, here is what I literally stumbled upon at this point. A portable sewing kit left over from my girlfriend on the table I was working on. Turns out uh, sewing needles might be the most powerful hardware diagnostic tool ever. Pick one, start sewing that motherboard in concrete terms I just tried to connect some chip pins with my needle uh, while the device is running and trigger some short circuits expecting fun things to happen. Uh, let it be known that still a considered science. Uh, first I tried to randomly uh, stitch RAM chip pins to make the RAM else check fail. Uh, it only made the power on fail and, and nothing interesting happened. Then I uh, switch to suing the flash chip, because uh, it's where we want to go anyway. And the OS image is likely stored uh, in such chip. Well, one does not simply mess uh, with such chip. You don't want to accidentally trigger uh, um, a memory clear pin uh, from the chip. Uh, so you want to carefully look at the data sheet from the chip, which was also available on the internet. And I tried at two locations on pins that are used to define addresses bytes um, in the memory while it is read or uh, written to. And I expected to prevent the bootloader from um, being able to load the operating system. And it worked uh, so well, actually. Bootloader attempts to load the OS image from the stitch flash memory um, twice, fails twice, and goes straight to the recovery position waiting uh, for the 911. In concrete terms, it opens um, an interactive uh, shell in the bootloader, which is uh, made available on the serial interface. So browsing this new power, we can find the bootloader um, is actually a variant of U-boot, uh, an apparently very common uh, one um, in embedded devices. The bootloader can access the flash memory because it's where the booted OS image is, uh, namely a Linux one. The bootloader shell is correctly I must say correctly limited by the manufacturer and a very few comments are available, but it is possible to read and display bytes from an arbitrary MAPID uh, memory zone, which is enough uh, to fully dump the flash memory. Um, well, actually sort of, because uh, additional uh, scripting is required to build a memory image from uh, packs of X-string data that are displayed on the terminal, and it took four hours to read all the memory from the low bandwidth uh, serial interface. Flash memory content is not encrypted, and the Linux system image can be extracted from it. We can then explore uh, the modem file system offline. Starting to, to dig in the Linux uh, file system, we can quickly find some uh, more room. First, we can set a bootloader interruption delay, so we can get back to the bootloader um, by typing any key uh, during the boot without any suing. Uh, then we can enable uh, Linux uh, boot logs on the serial uh, terminal so we can get interesting additional information about um, the memory layout uh, while the system is booting. Last but not least, uh, digging a bit deeper and using the offline image we already have, it turns out some uh, magic flags from the bootloader are actually leveraged as a configuration file in the final uh, Linux system. So this means um, by enabling feature or setting flags in the bootloader environment, we can change the behavior of the final uh, Linux system. To make that a bit more concrete as an arbitrary example, simply setting a bootloader flag to uh, an arbitrary value will enable um, telnet access on the LAN side with root privileges. So now we can uh, start directly exploring the live system while it is running with the root privilege. And I guess that will be all uh, for today. Uh, the last described uh, modem access enabled, of course, further exploration on a way larger scale, for instance, um, a prop proprietary binary analysis and a firmware deployment system uh, analysis. But uh, 
let's get realistic now. Uh, even with such an access, uh, such hypothesis, and, and such backed um, option that we explored, a lot of things just can't be discovered or even confirmed um, without access to pro proprietary data and logs from the network side of such systems, which of course uh, we don't have. We still have a lot to find and confirm about this story because we only have all perspective from uh, this analysis. Uh, and I hope we will, but meanwhile, uh, try to demonstrate how dedicated we can be to gather knowledge uh, on a presumably complex cyber attack scenario in a short time and how much there can be to explore in such a case. Uh, thank you again for your attention. Yeah, I don't many, know if we have some thanks. more time, but I will be happy to answer questions. You know, we, 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 will have, um, we will have time for uh, one or two questions while we set up uh, some kit for the next presentation. Does anybody have a question at this time for Pierre? Okay, it appears not then. At this time, Pierre, thank you very much.